Welcome to God's Planning, contemplative preachers, contemporary age. Each week, join the Dominican friars as they consider all things Catholic. Welcome to God's Planning, and this our third episode in our Triduum Retreat on Holy Saturday. I'm Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic, and I'm joined here by Father Gregory Pine here in D.C., and with Father Patrick Briscoe, who is up in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, today, on, on this, this third day of the retreat, we are going to look at the seven readings from the Old Testament, a sort of history or a course through salvation history, to meditate on the readings, to share our, our thoughts. If you haven't had the chance yet, um, feel free to go back and um, listen to our, our retreat uh, podcast from uh, Holy Thursday. We did a sort of stay-at-home pilgrimage, seven church walk, and through the, through the major and minor basilicas of Rome. And then on Friday, uh, the seven last words of Christ from the cross, and today the seven Old Testament readings um, that we hear at the Easter Vigil. The Easter Vigil uh, on, on Holy Saturday really um, is the great celebration or the beginning of the great celebration of our Lord's resurrection. And as you, as you probably well know, the Easter Vigil begins in the darkness of, of Holy Saturday night and comes alive with the, with the Easter fire from which the Paschal candle is lit. Uh, if you can imagine in your in your mind, or if you remember from from being there, that the the Paschal candle, the light of Christ, enters into the into the darkness of the church, into the the darkness of the night, and um, that that flame is is a symbol of Christ's life, and it is a symbol of Christ's resurrection. And as that as that flame goes, as the deacon chants the light of Christ, that that light is spread throughout the church to the candles of the faithful, and then once assembled, the deacon chants the great exultat. Um, that great hymn of, of praise to the Paschal candle, how it was made, um, to, the, to how Christ saves us, to the glory of his resurrection. And after that, we, we sit in the darkness of the church and hear these seven Old Testament readings uh, that take us through the course of salvation history. So that's kind of where we find ourselves now in the midst of this epic liturgy that the church offers on the, on the night of, of the resurrection. So as we go through the readings, we'll, we'll uh, read selections from the readings because they can be quite long and um, so as to save a, a bit of time and not bore you. But feel free to, to follow along in a Magnificat or the, your Bible or lectionary or that sort of thing if you want to pick up the, the, entire, uh, the entire reading there. So with that, we'll, we'll dive right in. Um, the, first, the first reading that we have is uh, from the book of Genesis. And we'll, I'll read, as I said, just a selection from the very beginning of, of the sacred scriptures, from the beginning of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland and darkness covered the abyss while a mighty wind swept over the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came, and morning followed, the first day. God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. God blessed them, saying, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and all the living things that move on earth. And so it happened. God looked at everything he had made, and he found it very good. We begin the story, or our course through salvation history, at the very beginning, with, with creation. And the creation narratives are not to be read as a sort of historical or a scientific account of, um, of creation, because they're not written as historical or scientific accounts. Rather, they're, they're myths. Um, these, these stories that are contained in Genesis are myths, not like fairy tales or not even lies or made up, but they're narratives that, that, that convey a truth or many truths. And when we read the, the creation narrative, when we read it in its entirety or in its selection, the creation narrative teaches us, tr teaches us fundamental truths about God and about us. And if we look at Genesis, there are four things that this creation story from Genesis teaches us. First, that God is one. That God is one 
tri, well, one God, we learned that he's triune later, but that, that God is one and that God creates and that the divine purpose of creation is not so, it's not so that God has some play thing or something to manipulate, but comes from his divine goodness. And we hear that at the end of this reading, that God saw that all creation, everything created was good. And the fourth thing here is that God is not the cause of evil. God doesn't create the evil that is in the world. So God is one. God's divine purpose for creation, to share in his divine life, that creation is good and that God is, is not the cause of evil. And when we look at the course of salvation history, when we begin to sort of dive into how it was that God began, how it was that God created, we have to keep these things in mind. This is the foundation for everything that, that we'll hear the rest through the rest of the readings on Holy Saturday, but it's also the foundation for the whole, for the whole mystery of the Triduum for the whole mystery of our redemption and for the whole mystery of our salvation. That God is one that he creates, his divine purpose is, is that of love, uh, that his creation is good, and that evil is not a result of, of, of his hand. Um, but in the midst of that evil, he, he still comes to save. Yeah, I think um, people often draw attention to the fact that the Genesis story is parallel to other ancient Near Eastern myths and the ones you hear described are like the Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh. And it's fascinating that the inspired author is being very deliberate about receiving that content, but then transposing it. So in those stories, God is not one. There are many gods. And also God is not singular in his purpose. Rather, God, the gods are divided and there's infighting and there's violence. And that the creation of man is almost as if a mistake, Right. And it seems like evil results from God's disorder and that we are just kind of subject to death and difficulty by virtue of the fact that we were dealt uh, a bad hand. Um, but in the Genesis story, the, the sacred author, you know, by virtue of the Holy Spirit at work within him, um, is conveying that these things, uh, while literarily interesting, are not true. And by virtue of the grace healing his mind and guiding his hand, he's able to say the true things about God. And so when we call it a myth, again, like you said, not a fairy tale or a lie. Rather, it's just the genre in which God communicates those deepest and most profound things about who he is and who we are in light of that revelation. <clears throat> Moving then from the very beginning of Genesis, we'll move on to a bit later in Genesis from the story of creation to the story of Abraham with Father Patrick. It's said that um, the whole of the Old Testament is about Christ. And nowhere is this more clear, I think, than in the story of Abraham. So listen to a, lines, a few lines from this reading. God put Abraham to the test. He called to him, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Then God said, take your son Isaac, your only one whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. There you shall offer him up as a holocaust on a height that I will point out to you. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Then he reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son, but the Lord's messenger called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Do not lay your hand on the boy, said the messenger. Do not do the least thing to him. I know how devoted you are to God, since you did not withhold from me your own beloved son. The whole of the Old Testament points to Christ, and here in the story of Abraham and the near sacrifice of Isaac, we see Isaac, the son, the willing victim, ready to lay down his life. Isaac, ready to take... Uh, ready to take upon himself that which the Father is asking him. We see the wood of the cross. We see, uh, as we've been thinking about the love between the Father and the Son, we see the total devotion, uh, the, handing over, uh, the handing over of life, all of this leading, leading to, uh, to, to signs that just become so clear to us as we consider Christ's own, Christ's own passion, his own, um, his, his own handing over of his life. 
I, I often think when I read <clears throat> this passage from uh, from Genesis, the story of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac of that great painting by Caravaggio. Um, and if I if I remember it correctly, the you have Isaac sort of being held down on one side by by Abraham being sacrificed, and it's the the painting captures the moment just as the angel swoops in to to hold to stay Abraham's hand. If I, I I believe his hand is kind of raised with the knife, and the angel kind of grabs it. And Abraham kind of looks back surprisingly at the angel because he was so focused on on the sacrifice at hand. Um, it, it, the, the parallel between father son, of course, that's the you know the an analogy between father and the son, you know, the, our heavenly father and Christ the son, but we also have these sort of father son um, parallels and relationships throughout the gospel um, or throughout the scriptures and into the gospel. I think of the prodigal son um, and and the father of the prodigal son. These sort of relationships that reveal to us uh, more and more as time goes and as as scripture progresses, the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, but also the relationship between God the Father and us. Um, so we have with with Abraham and Isaac this this uh, devotion to God that is consuming, all consuming that the father you know to the Father and that the Father has. And then as as our Lord reveals Himself more and more as as, as we enter into the incarnation and and the new covenant we see sort of the tenderness of the father come, you know, become more clear. And even through the prophecies of, of the Old Testament, this becomes more and more clear. Um, not that God changes or that God was evil and now that God's good, but the sort of revelation of God takes more flesh from our point of view. It, it becomes more, more rich and more full such that in, in the fullness of time, um, the, the, the father's love and mercy is, is truly manifested on the cross that so resembles the sacrifice of, of Isaac uh, um, that we just that we just heard of. Moving from Genesis, then we continue on into the book of Exodus I'm here with Father Gregory. Here we go. Just a, a few verses from the beginning of the third reading. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. And you lift up your staff and with hand outstretched over the sea, split the sea in two that the Israelites may pass through it on dry land. But I will make the Egyptians so obstinate that they will go in after them. Then I will receive glory through Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and charioteers. <clears throat> so pretty early on in the Old Testament, we learn that sin is a reality with which we are going to have to reckon. So the creation story ends in Genesis 2.24, and that Adam and Eve had already fallen by Genesis 3.5. So they made it a whole four verses, which is uh, commendable. Um, <clears throat> but from that point on, it's a story of human sin. And you could think of Cain and Abel, or of uncovering the nakedness of Noah, or of Lamech, or of the Tower of Babel, and all the way down. You know, just, it's just a story of sin. And it raises for us the question of whether God has actually given us everything that we need in order to be happy, in order to be righteous, or whether perhaps God is to blame. Um, you know, we say or we repeat that God writes straight with crooked lines, but need there be crooked lines at all? Uh, are we not perhaps ill-made? And I think here uh, there's like a kind of helpful illumination to this that comes from one of the fathers of the church, Gregory of Nyssa. He says, when the sun shines, it melts wax and it hardens clay. So here we hear him, the, the sacred author speaking about him making the Egyptians obstinate. And we've heard it many times up to this point in the book of Exodus that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. But God is giving the offer of grace. God is moving each human heart to turn to him, to consent to his offer of salvation. Uh, but not all assent to that. And if one does not assent to that, it is by virtue of his own fault. And yet God uses the sin of, you know, sinful men and women as a way by which um, to show a more textured or a more varied dispensation of salvation. So in this case here, uh, the obstinacy of Moses or the hardening of his heart, it redounds ultimately to the glory and the deliverance of the Hebrew people. And the whole next chapter, chapter 15, which you hear in the responsorial psalm that accompanies this reading, is one of jubilation. It's a song of praise to the God who has made good out of evil, uh, who has delivered his people and redeemed them and has shown himself faithful a covenant God in the process. I, I think that it's very interesting that this is, um, the, that the liturgy requires us to pray the reading of um, the passage of the Israelites through the Red Sea and to sing um, their canticle from Exodus. 
So we can choose a, a number of these Old Testament readings, right? There's a selection that's possible. But in the course of the Easter Vigil, we have to pray this reading. And one of the reasons why I think that is, the designers of the liturgy have their own purposes, so I'm not pretending to know them all. But one of, one of the things that is remarkable about this and one of, one of the glorious things about this reading is that this story and uh, particularly the canticle from Exodus, the song, the song of the Red Sea, uh, is one of the most jubilant parts of the Old Testament. And um, so the whole liturgy, the whole liturgy of the Easter Vigil speaks to us of the victory of God, right? Of his mercy, of his steadfast love, of the unfolding of all the numerous ways that he's come close to his people. And here in this song, the song of triumph, the song of the Red Sea, the Israelites um, are able to, to really rejoice for the first time in a great victory of their God over other gods. Um, and uh, that, that to me is, is just very striking. So now that we've covered a bit of Genesis, we've covered the Israelites' um, exodus in the book of Exodus. Mm absolutely named mm. we'll, we'll move well we'll move into the thank you uh, we'll move into the prophets into the prophets of the old testament with our fourth reading and the fourth reading is is one of two readings from the prophet isaiah uh the first from the 54th chapter of isaiah and just a, a few lines from from this prophecy the one who has become your husband is your maker his name is the lord of hosts your redeemer is the holy one of israel called god of all the earth the Lord calls you back like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, a wife married in youth and then cast off, says your God. For a brief moment I abandoned you, but with great tenderness I will take you back. O oh, afflicted one, storm-battered and unconsoled, I lay your pavements with carnelians and your foundations with sapphires. I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of carbuncles, and all of your walls of precious stones. Now, the first thing that might catch your attention in this reading is, is not so much the prophecy itself, but the strange kind of stones that Isaiah speaks of. But um, I had to look up what some of them were um, because I didn't know exactly what kind of stones they were. But uh, throughout, the, throughout the pro this prophecy or what, what, what's happening here in this prophecy as we're moving through salvation history is that um, our Lord is reminding us, or our Lord is, is putting into our minds again, that his covenant with Israel, his covenant with his chosen people, is, is that of a marriage covenant. Uh, God is the bridegroom, and Israel in the old dispensation, and the church in the new dispensation is his beloved bride. And we hear our Lord use this language when the people wonder why his disciples in, in the New Testament, why they don't fast. Christ says, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? And then St. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, uses this language, for example, when he speaks about husbands and wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. There are two things that are of, I think, great importance in this prophecy from Isaiah. First is that our Lord reminds us he reminds the Israelites, but you know, also us, that he is always faithful to his covenant. Even when we turn from him, even in our sinfulness, he remains faithful time and again. His faithfulness is, is steadfast. And that's something we ought to take, uh, to take stock of or to take heed of and, and remember that that is sort of that unchanging reality of God and his love for us. The second thing is that our Lord's love for us is super abundant. His love is, is, is not contained to simply what's, what's just necessary or kind of, um, you know, the, the most basic kind of offering of love, but really one that is effusive and, and, and super abundant, as I said. His, his grace goes above and beyond constantly. And this description of sort of lining the roads and the walls of Jerusalem with these, with these fine stones, with these precious stones, um, seems seems maybe strange to line the roads with sapphires and diamonds and these sorts of things but it shows to us that our that our lord um is extravagant with us he's extravagant in his in his love and in his mercy um our lord reminds us that despite or isaiah reminds us that despite our sin despite the times that we turn away he awaits us 
He awaits us with not just what is necessary, but what is with, with more than we could ask or imagine. Yeah, the imagery of, um, you know, like a bridegroom and his bride is one that's, you know, throughout the, throughout the prophets. And, you know, we don't hear in this liturgy from the book of the prophet Hosea, but it's perhaps most evident there where the Lord in his uh, you know, revelation to the prophet instruction to marry a harlot as a kind of prophetic sign that this is the state of Israel's soul. Namely, that she plays the harlot every time she wanders from the true worship of the Lord God. But though we be faithless, yet he remains faithful from account of the fact that he cannot deny himself. And so, you know, in the present day and age, often, oftentimes, nuptial imagery, some, some are very fond of it. Others are exhausted by it on account of the fact that the institution is kind of in a, in a sad state, right? So, so many failed marriages and many of us affected negatively by a lot of failed marriages. And so like hearing these scriptures is part of our being healed in our understanding of what marriage entails, because it's something that God uses to describe his relationship to us. Um, so it's possible to love another person uh, and to love that person well and to love that person in a permanent and committed way because God gives us the grace to do it because such is God's nature. Uh, and that may take the shape of, you know, the marriage uh, between a man and a woman and the sacrament or, you know, that that all vocations can kind of be described in just these terms. Not It's not always helpful to draw the comparison, but it can shed light, namely that what we're all approaching in these states of life is the permanence of heaven, is that, that perfect embrace of the Lord, which admits of no fear of loss or diminishment, right? Which has this covenant fidelity uh, to such a bewildering extent that we, we cannot look away. So that's, that, that's the thing for which we all strive and strain. And that's the grace that's given by the Lord in the sacred page, in the sacraments, and specifically in the states of life that he appoints for our perfection. With Isaiah's prophecy here, the, the fifth reading, the next reading is also from our prophet Isaiah. So we're staying within the same book, uh, and Father Patrick's gonna, gonna take us there. These are the first few lines of um, the second excerpt from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, all you who are thirsty, come to the water. You who have no money, come receive grain and eat. Come without paying, without cost. Drink wine and milk. Why spend your money for what is not bread, your wages for what fails to satisfy? Heed me, and you shall eat well. You shall delight in rich fear. Come to me heedfully, listen, that you might have life. I will renew with you the everlasting covenant, the benefits assured to David. Hear the Lord again. Um, is the great provider. So Father Jacob Bertrand mentioned how God provides in abundance. Uh, these verses of Isaiah um, remind me of elsewhere where the prophet speaks of God's holy mountain, what it will be like to dwell with the Lord, um, to be able to, to be able to be with the Lord, where the, where the calf and the lion shall lie down, right? Where children um, shall play with adders at the adder's den and they, they won't get bitten. Uh, there, there shall be peace. Um, Isaiah's kingdom, uh, the, the peaceable kingdom of Isaiah, is a, is a place where there is plenty, where there is provision, uh, where there is no need for want. Christ sounds very much like Isaiah in the Gospels. Think of the, the great verses of Matthew. Uh, Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon your shoulders and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart. You know, these verses associated with the sacred heart of Jesus, uh, showing, that, the, showing that Christ, um, like the prophet, uh, the Lord, Christ understands, like the prophet understands, that the Lord's kingdom is a peaceable kingdom, that life with the Lord is not life of um, unrest or, or, um, or, a, or want, but, but life with the Lord is fulfillment and peace. I think there's, there's something in us that kind of maybe within fallen human nature that that rebels against commands or that there's you know you you just think of a little kid for example when you tell them don't take don't touch that what are, the next thing they're going to do is is touch that and <laughs> you know there's just this sort of rebellious kind of reaction to commands and yet there's also something in us that is attracted to to that and perhaps not to command in the negative sense but direction uh, we talk about in, in the moral life, when we talk about freedom and what freedom consists, um, is, you know, we could ask the question, does, does human freedom, is it constituted by having a sort of wide open um, choice 
in, 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 in infinite number of choices with respect to everything that we're doing? Or is it that we've been sort of created and habituated in such a way that we're able to choose the best thing most easily? Um, through, you know, through the growth in virtue, through, through direction by grace, good example, these sorts of things. Here in, in the prophecy from Isaiah, and as Father Patrick mentioned, even from Christ's words in, in the gospel, um, we're commanded by Christ to come. We're commanded by, by him to come after him, as he says. And, the, and two, the, you know, in, the, in Isaiah's prophecy, to come to the Lord. Mm-hmm. It's not a sort of, you know, follow me if you want, or, you know, this is one option among many. Um, no, our Lord tells us, come to me, full stop, come to me, um, not to shackle us, not to make us sort of um, his, his puppets or his slaves, but it's because if you think back to our first reading in, from Genesis, that we're made for him, and that the whole course of salvation history is a, is a call back to that relationship. Um, to that marriage, to that marriage, that covenant relationship. It's that call back to him. This is why he takes the Israelites out of Egypt um, into the, to the promised land. This is why he died on the cross, that we can come to him, that, that we can have that direction um, and be called by, by the one who has created us, by the one, by the one who loves us. Moving then to our penultimate reading, our sixth reading, uh, we remain within the prophets, but another prophet, the prophet Baruch. And we also remain with Father Patrick on the prophet Baruch. What a blessing. (laughs) What a joy. (laughs) Again, taken from the the first few lines of the prophet Baruch. Hear, O Israel, the commandments of life. Listen and know prudence. How is it, Israel, that you are in the land of your foes, grown old in a foreign land, defiled with the dead, accounted with those destined for the netherworld? You have forsaken the fountain of wisdom. Had you walked in the way of God, you would have dwelt in enduring peace. Learn where prudence is, where strength, where understanding, that you may know also where our length of days and life, where light of the eyes and peace Who has found the place of wisdom? Who has entered into her treasuries? The one who knows all things knows her. He has probed her by his knowledge. The one who established the earth for all time. In my mind, these words of the prophet Baruch um, harken back to where we began the liturgy, where we began our, our contemplation here, um, because it's a kind of recreation. Remember who it was that made the earth, the prophet says. Who, who knows how to make sense of all of this? Um, there are similar lines in other works of wisdom literature. Uh, I'm thinking of the famous line that the Lord speaks to Job in the book of Job. Where were you when I founded the earth, the Lord says to Job. Uh, who is it that knows creation? Well, it's the God who made it because the God who made all things doesn't know them from the exterior. He knows them, he knows them from the inside, from, from the essence of things themselves. That's how God knows creation. God is inviting Israel then to, um, to a kind of, to, to a real fullness, to that, to that first state where he, had, where he had made things. That's what it means to, for God to have given Israel land. It's not just a random place that he creates for his people. It's a fruitful land. It's a land where they can dwell with him. It's an idyllic place. It's like the first creation. It's like what that first man knew in Eden. I think, um, yeah, the connection that you draw there with the passage from Job 38, where God shows up in the whirlwind, uh, it's fascinating because it draws our attention to the fact that when we ask the Lord questions, he doesn't often respond with direct answers. And that's not because he's like, I don't know, a psychotherapist or because he doesn't have the answers or because he's just being like coy or otherwise unhelpful. Um, Chesterton actually wrote an introduction to the book of Job, which is staggering. Um, And in that introduction, he says that God answers our skepticism with a deeper skepticism. Um, Here I think of, well, now I'm just going to go reference on reference. Um, there's this, you know, short story by Flannery O'Connor called Good Country People. Manly Pointer uh, is a Bible salesman, and he seduces 
this kind of uh, nihilistic, atheistic, academic type, but he ends up seducing her and then he undermines her nihilism with a deeper nihilism. So that's one thing, right? But what God does is he undermines our skepticism with a saving skepticism, which is to say that he undermines what we think that we know by showing us that we don't know it and that the only knowledge that we can have is a kind of knowledge of the cross, which is to say that we are most confident and certain when we are begging for the meaning of our lives before the Lord. And if we are not begging for the meaning of our lives, then he will bring us to a place by his uh, yeah, saving designs such that we be, again, uh, alerted to the fact of our finitude, of our createdness, and that we can once, once again assume a position of asking, seeking, knocking, that we might in turn, yeah, receive. The final reading and our final stop in this course of salvation history is from a third prophet, the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, Father Gregory, take us, take us there. Let's do it. All right. So here's a, a short selection from this reading. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, not for your sakes do I act, house of Israel, but for the sake of my holy name, which you profaned among the nations to which you came. I will prove the holiness of my great name profaned among the nations in whose midst you have profaned it. Thus, the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when in their sight I prove my holiness through you. So here, the last of the readings focalizes for us the whole point. The whole point of salvation history is for the glory of God. Now, mind you, does God need his glory added to? No. And yet, we are for the glory of God. We oftentimes speak about like a twofold end of man, the glory of God and the salvation of souls. The salvation of our souls just is the glory of God, right? So the two things are one, but just described under different aspects. So the Lord is saying like to the house of Israel, uh, not for your sakes do I act, house of Israel. God chooses for God's sake. Now, mind you, to us, that sounds egomaniacal because we think in human terms. But for God, it is not so because the very kind of like rationale of God's thinking and choosing is God himself because God exhausted all that there is of being. So there's nothing beyond God for him to take account of, right? But God includes us in that sweep. God creates us out of love, right? Because God didn't need us. Rather, he creates us because he thought we might enjoy the prospect of enjoying life with him. Um, and so God's love is the very pattern of our being created and God's love is the very end of our being created. So we are meant to proceed from him to be typified, you know, by and to return to him in love. And so this is all in a certain sense for us, but ultimately it's for God because it being for us is a fruit of our recognizing that it is for God. Um, so here you see God just like reaffirm the fact that this is for his holiness and we think of holiness in terms of like grace points often because we're like savage utilitarians. But when we talk about holiness, we mean the fact that God just is in excelling fashion, in radiant fashion, in noble and in beautiful fashion, and that the very meaning of our lives is caught up in that and that we can actually transcend the limitations of our kind of grubby nature and then abide with him forever in heaven. And that's the point and it's worth it. So it's good. One of the one of the parts of this this reading is uh, from or the prophecy from Ezekiel is is our Lord telling the prophet or the prophet telling uh, the people through uh, through his through his words um, that that our Lord will give us a new heart that he will replace our our stony hearts um, and and there's there's real beauty in that because if we look at the whole course even just through our, our brief kind of uh, brief cover of salvation history through these readings from the Easter vigil. But even if we look at that from the moment of creation, as Father Gregory said earlier, Adam and Eve, it didn't last that long. Uh, and then the whole sort of history there is, is our Lord establishing that covenant and reestablishing it again and again with those, with, with his people who have broken it. And we can kind of think of the image here of, um, you know, when, when you have a, like a physical cut or something and, and scar tissue or a surgery or something and scar tissue kind of replaces that, that otherwise good and kind of healthy, healthy mus muscle or, or tissue that, that scar tissue becomes hard. And if that's damaged again, yet harder and harder. And same with our, with our hearts that as we sin, as the people of Israel sin, as they were unfaithful to, to the covenant, their hearts became harder and harder such that they became like stone. 
um, turned off and closed to that glory of God, to living in that glory, to accepting that invitation, um, to living in that covenant. And our Lord's goodness is such that he sort of starts over for us by his, by his grace, by replacing this, the hardness of our hearts, by opening up um, that which has been calloused, has been scarred, and, and refreshing that with new life, with, with new and, and life that, that, we, that we might glorify him and live in, in, that divine, in that divine communion. Glory. Glory. Well, we thank you for, for tuning in to this uh, third uh, podcast of our, of our Triduum retreat. Uh, we hope that it's been a little um, consolation, helpful for you as you are um, stuck at home, unable to attend these, the liturgies and the masses during these most sacred of days. Um, know that we will continue to keep you in our prayers as we approach the, the glory of our Lord's resurrection, continue to offer masses for you uh, and for your intentions. Um, feel free to share the podcast with those who you think might might enjoy a listen or might might need a listen. And uh, tune in tomorrow. We'll have our continued Lectio Divina um, for Easter Sunday. Thanks all and God bless. Thanks for listening to God's Plan, a work of the Dominican Friars of the Province of St. Joseph. Visit us at opeast.org.